an analysis of Nero simply wouldn't be complete without exploring what he would have considered as his main identity that of an artist. Had the internet existed in the time of Nero, Nero's Wikipedia page would have read something like this. Nero was the fifth emperor of Rome and the last of the Julio-Claudian line, as well as poet, actor, musician, singer, tragedian, musician, and inventor of musical instruments. Quite impressive, except Nero should have been just the emperor of Rome. He held the title of princeps, which meant the first, foremost chief, it was the official state title inaugurated by Augustus. Nero was commander-in-chief over a proud, stuffy, and quite a macho society which placed much more value on their military, legal, and civil engineering talents than the arts. In fact, many artists, from musicians to dancers, were lowly tavern dwellers and prostitutes. This is quite the contrast with the ancient Greeks who did value the arts, spreading their culture all across the Eastern world through the conquests of Alexander the Great. We often lump the Greek and Roman worlds together. It's true that in many ways, the Romans later became the inheritors and torchbearers of Greece, incorporating and expanding on many of its innovations in all sorts of fields. But at the time of Nero's reign, much of the Roman elite was still a bit iffy about the Greeks. After all, it was only by the 30s BC, only a few generations before Nero's time, that the Hellenistic world, the territories that had been conquered by Alexander the Great, had fallen to the Roman Empire. So Greek culture still wasn't exactly mainstream and the elite had doubtful opinions about Greek views on art, sports and culture. Many considered these art forms made the Romans weak, effeminate and military inept. While they were impressed by the achievements of the Greeks, the Romans would have thought that had they spent less time in the theater, at the gym or philosophizing, they might have avoided being conquered. To the Roman elite, occasionally playing the lyre, for example, was fine, maybe after work or in one's leisure time or retirement. And it might have been acceptable, maybe, as training for public life, but being anything more than an amateur in any artistic pursuit was discreditable. Likewise for competitive sports. Wrestling, a traditional Greek favorite, was shunned. The Greek practice of exercising while nude was considered a slippery slope to homosexuality and therefore not good for training soldiers. Leisurely practice of extracurricular activities is still acceptable with today's world leaders. The fact Barack Obama had some skill in basketball was a plus in terms of PR, but then imagine Obama putting his presidency second to competing in the NBA. This is kind of what happened with Nero, except artists were scum. <laughs> so for the Roman senator, Nero was debasing himself and his position in the same way Obama would debase himself by joining a bordello or a burlesque troupe, and not a good one either. Even for Roman sports and games, the idea of a politician showing too much enthusiasm from his seat was cause for concern. Actively participating in them was taking it to an entire new level of disgrace. So when Nero went out of his way to perform in many of the games and celebrations he organized, spending months out of politics to compete in tournaments around the empire, he was pointing a big fat middle finger to the establishment and just did what he wanted. Ever since he was a boy, Nero had been interested in music and chariot racing. His father was said to have enjoyed chariot races and plays, quote, to a degree not befitting his position. For the young Nero, though, it was music that was closer to his heart. Immediately after becoming emperor in 54 AD, he summoned one of Rome's leading lyre players to his court, providing the young ruler with intensive musical training. Lyre playing was almost always accompanied by song or some kind of poetry. This was the art form that Nero was probably the most skilled at, and certainly the one he associated most with his image. On coins, statues, and vases, Nero disseminated his image as a kithrode, the name for a musician who sung and played the lyre simultaneously. The profession was familiar with Romans as well as the clothes involved. It dated back to the ancient Greeks. Apollo, the Greek sun god, was meant to be a kithrode himself, and Nero, unsurprisingly, was very keen to intertwine his image with that of the sun. As you might expect, performing wasn't possible for Nero. At least in his early reign, he still had censuring pressures from his mother, his advisors, and the Senate. His mentors could just about be swayed, but not his mother. 
To perform, Nero would have to kill her. So he did that in 59 AD, and that same year, finally free from motherly constraint, Nero performed for the very first time at games he hosted on his palace grounds. It was private because it was on his private grounds, but he basically invited the masses as his guests. The games were, of course, in celebration of Nero, more specifically the day his first beard was shaved, at the age of 21. It was quite an important public event. His beard was even placed in a golden ball and offered to Jupiter. It was clear that Nero wanted an audience. In 64 AD, the emperor decided it was time to go public once and for all. By his own words, hidden music wins no respect. He appeared on a public stage for the first time in Naples, a Greek city which he believed would be receptive and appreciative of his art. Later that year, Nero competed as a charioteer at the Neronia, a festival Nero had of course named after himself. After the successes of the year 64, it was free sailing from there. The praise he'd received, whether genuine or feigned, gave him the confidence he needed to become, at least in his eyes, a professional athlete and performer. Nero sang, acted, raced, and competed as an athlete until his end in 68 AD. What's interesting is he didn't just flip between one art form to the next. No, he was dedicated to becoming the absolute best in whatever activity he took on. He didn't just forsake one for the other. He kept pushing himself to learn and master new forms of entertainment and expression. Nero was one of the very few Roman emperors who wrote poetry with relative ease. Eventually, he graduated from a kithroad to an actor in Greek tragedies. He started racing as a charioteer around the same time. Later in life, he performed in pantomimes, a popular show which was almost like a solo ballet, danced to a chorus and an orchestra. In his final days, while the provinces were in open rebellion, Nero summoned his advisors to an emergency meeting. Expecting an order to launch a military attack, his advisors were stunned when Nero proceeded to show them that he had, quote, discovered how to make the water organ produce a larger and more tuneful sound. Perplexed, the advisors were then forced to contain themselves while Nero gave them a detailed presentation on the different models he had invented, which he planned to exhibit in the theatre. This was more than a passion for the performing arts and sports, with some self-drive added to the mix. No, the guy was obsessed. The emperor was especially preoccupied with his singing voice. Part of his intensive regime involved lying down with lead plates on his stomach to strengthen his diaphragm. It said he even slept with the plates on top of him. Nero constantly had a voice coach by his side, reminding him not not to overuse his voice or to cover his mouth with a handkerchief. His obsessions with his craft interfered with what the Romans saw as good governance. He ignored his daily duties and even endangered his life. When he returned from his artistic odyssey in Greece, Nero never addressed his soldiers in person, preferring to spare his voice and send them messages either by letter or passing them through a subordinate. He would purge himself after eating and deny himself certain fruits like apples or other fruits that could harm his voice. On certain days of the month, he only ate chives preserved in olive oil. He would also regularly treat bruises and sprains from chariot racing with a solution of powdered boar's dung. This obsession extended to sports. While in Greece, Nero took a keen interest in wrestling. When he wasn't competing himself, he would act as a judge, sitting on the ground in the stadium, personally breaking up fights if they ever got out of hand. Again, just imagine a world leader doing this. Some overly keen amateur, completely out of his depth, without any shame or a single trace of imposter syndrome. When it came to chariot racing, the man was stark raving mad. Now, the standard for driving chariots was two horses, sometimes four at most. These you'd have to steer at full gallop for 12 laps on a course that was 2,000 feet long with extremely sharp turns. And this was a race, right? There could be up to 12 chariots on a single course, barging into others at turns, crushing or overturning with their horses and riders too. Serious injury was not uncommon, and many charioteers died. Hence, racing was an extremely dangerous affair, and you needed a tremendous amount of skill. At the Greek Games, Nero decided he would race not with two, not with four, but with 10 horses. We're told that he fell off his chariot and was almost trampled over. The accident had left him in shock and the games were almost called off. But Nero insisted on resuming the race and ultimately he won it. 
Even if the jury had been bought, this is still impressive. If not a testament to much common sense, then at least to some bravery and persistence. But it also showed a serious competitive streak. Apparently, he had been inspired by his friend, Mithridates, king of the Bosphorus, who was said to ride as many as 16 horses at once. So Nero, who had earlier criticised him for being a show-off, didn't exactly one-up him, but he might have wanted to find glory himself, and with a much larger audience. Nero ended up giving up much of his life to performance and spectacle. These became his raison d'etre. When you have somebody with a personality as insecure and authoritarian as Nero, when that person feels outclassed, slighted, or challenged in any way, they become a tremendously bad sport. Some of Nero's most pathetic acts of tyranny linked to his artistic and athletic ventures. During the Greek tour, Nero was courteous with other contestants who had similar levels of talent, and he even tried to win their favour. But he would badmouth them behind their backs. Sometimes he would openly taunt them. If his competitors were especially talented, he would bribe them to underperform or simply not take part in the games. Worse still, Nero would have his rivals killed. When he returned to Rome, he had an actor named Paris murdered. Paris reportedly had refused to train Nero in the art of pantomime on the grounds Nero didn't have the talent for it. Another reason might just be that Nero considered him too serious a rival. It might even be a combination of both. The obvious consequence of this performative tyranny was there was, in effect, no competition whatsoever. The big farce of Nero's Greek tour is that he won every single game he participated in. The judges not only received huge amounts of money when they were normally just unpaid officials, they were even awarded Roman citizenship. The ancient sources tell us that even spectators were coerced into watching Nero sing or perform. Here we should take these sources with a bucket of salt. We're told that when he performed, the gates were shut and no one was allowed to leave the theatre for any reason. Women gave birth in the audience, people climbed up the walls to leave the arena, or faked death so that they could be carried out. Soldiers apparently died in the crush, while guards beat audience members who didn't applaud enthusiastically enough. Granted, the image is quite funny. A completely tone-deaf Nero squawking on stage to a captive audience, clawing the walls and risking death just to escape the torment. As with a lot of things in the past though, a good or a funny story doesn't always make for good history. Remember, these were biased accounts from hostile historians, and we can't know the levels of coercion for sure. Let's just say though, it's hard to imagine a pleb booing the emperor and getting away with it. In the same way, his advisors knew that they could be in Nero's good books as long as they brown-nosed him whenever possible. During his performances, they jostled for who could clap or cheer loudest. Future Emperor Vespasian made the mistake of leaving the theatre on several occasions or falling asleep. Nero was said to be so offended by this that he removed him from his inner circle and refused to even see him. Perhaps the biggest farce of the whole thing, though, was that Nero somehow convinced himself that there was competition. His behaviour on the stage, and during his musical and theatrical performances, show how insecure he actually was, and how desperate he was for approval, adoration, and attention. Once, while acting in a tragedy in Greece, he dropped his scepter. He was quick to pick it up, but he was so nervous of the judges that he was genuinely worried he'd be disqualified. It was the other actor performing with him who managed to calm him down, assuring him that the audience, enraptured by his acting, hadn't even noticed. Though the judges were all bought off, he was seriously nervous of them. Before the Greek games, he addressed them saying, you being wise and experienced men ought to discount anything to mere chance. He was said to be extremely anxious during performances, and especially tense when the judges' results came in. Various historians have called this Nero deluding himself. There might be a little bit of that, but it's possible he genuinely craved the approval from experts, as well as, of course, the audiences. After all, Nero was extremely serious in his performances. He always obeyed the rules of liar playing. He never sat down when he was tired. He only wiped off his sweat with his tunic, and didn't allow himself to be seen spitting or clearing his nostrils. When analysing many of Nero's decisions and behaviours, it's useful to conceptualise them as part of Nero being a colossal prima donna. He used his political clout 
as the most powerful man in the world to make sure that he was publicly lauded. Long before the games, Greek envoys had visited him in his palace to offer him crowns, the reward for ancient Greek performances. Nero obviously hadn't participated in them, but because he was simply the best musician and performer in the world, he would have won anyway. When the Greeks sycophantically applauded his singing at dinner, he said, the Greeks alone know how to appreciate me and my art. At the Greek games in 66 and 67, Nero overturned centuries of glorious tradition for his own magnificence. Not only were the Olympic games pushed back from summer to autumn, they had been delayed by an entire year just so he could participate. For the first time ever, Athletic contests were to be accompanied by singing and acting purely for Nero's sake. And in the area near the gymnasium, where for centuries visitors to the games pitched their tents, Nero built himself an enormous pavilion which took up most of the space. Near the Temple of Zeus, he ordered the construction of elaborate wrestling grounds, called a palestra, for him to train. No doubt, Nero was a complete embarrassment, but at least the Romans had him out of their sights for about a year. You can only imagine their horror when Nero returned to the capital in full, ridiculous pomp. Wearing the Olympic crown and a Greek cloak, Nero entered the city through a breach in the city walls, riding in Augustus's triumphal chariot. This was the tradition for victors at the Greek games. In Rome, however, this came across as a complete mockery of the military triumph, a procession which normally went under the triumphal arch with legionaries behind the victor and which ended at the Temple of Jupiter on the Capitoline. Nero not only entered by a breach, but he was followed by bands of bought Praetorian servants and finished the procession at the Temple of Apollo instead. Even more embarrassing were the 1,808 crowns and prizes carried in front of his chariot, bearing the names of the cities he had won in and records of the games and his songs. It was far from the military celebrations of Julius Caesar and Augustus. The desertion of Nero by the Senate and the Praetorian Guard just several months later probably makes more sense in this light, and this diva-like megalomania would stay with him until the bitter end. Vindex, the governor of Gaul, bombarded Nero with a series of provocative charges and threatened open rebellion. All of these Nero snubbed or ignored. One taunt stung a little bit, which was calling Nero by his birth name Aenobarbus. But there was one charge which Nero simply could not tolerate. One lampoon Vindex knew would goad Nero into action, and that was saying Nero was rubbish on the lyre. Nero was furious. He could allow the slur on his name, and even said he'd revert back to his birth name, but an assault on his divine talent was simply crossing the line. He had spent his life perfecting his skills, and for this reason, the taunt proved that all of Vindex's other claims were false. Nero sent armies to crush Vindex with a reward of 10 million cestuses for his head. Several months later, when all hope seemed lost, Nero's artistic talents in his eyes would save the day. Proving how out of touch he was with reality, Nero's light bulb idea was to travel to Gaul when standing face to face with the Gaelic armies, he would simply weep. Then, having won over the hearts of the thousands of irate, disgruntled warriors, he would sing, sing songs of victory before his rejoicing subjects and take their breaths away with the performance on the new water organs that had so puzzled his advisors. In fact, he ought to start writing the songs as soon as possible, there wasn't a moment to lose. Yes, this was Nero's master plan. He would sing and play music for the rebellious Gaelic legions. He would travel in wagons, carrying all sorts of stage props and organs for his performances. He also brought legions of concubines dressed up as Amazons, the woman warriors of Greek mythology known for their riding skills and military courage. These concubines would all have men's haircuts and be armed to the teeth with axes and shields. As you probably guessed, this didn't happen. And as the provincial rebellion spread and gained ground on Rome, the Praetorian guards abandoned Nero. Many had been bribed to do so by one of Nero's enemies, a Praetorian prefect named Sabinus. What was Nero to do? Beg the Spanish governor, Galba, for mercy? Deliver an impassioned speech at the forum at the risk of getting stabbed to death like Caesar? Or seek help from Rome's great enemy, Parthia? Desperate though he was, 
he could fall back on one certainty. He could travel to Egypt and find refuge in the great city of Alexandria, a safe haven for a man like him who loved all things Greek. Quote, even if I am driven from the empire, this talent of mine, i.e. playing the lyre, will support me there. Yes, this was how confident Nero was in his talents. Before his death, we're also told Nero wept and wailed, repeatedly lamenting, what an artist dies in me, as he despairingly paced around his burial place. Now, he could have said this, but it's more likely, if he did say it, that it was a mistranslation of the Latin for what a craftsman I am in my dying, not an artist. Indeed, while preparing for his suicide at the villa of one of his freedmen, he ordered his companions to build him his tomb. This wasn't a glamorous coffin, but a pathetic trench in the ground, ringed by some even more pathetic bits of marble, chipped off parts of the villa. Looking down at his burial place, it makes much more sense for Nero to have said, look at this pile of garbage, look how low I've fallen, a debased craftsman. That said, what an artist in me, context aside, is just as Neronian, and even if he didn't say it, he probably should have. The big question though is, was Nero, the prima donna, actually any good? The short answer is, we don't know for sure. Our main ancient sources tell us his voice was, quote, husky and feeble, or otherwise slight and indistinct. Remember, these are our biased sources who wouldn't have heard him sing and likely got their information from yet more biased sources who wouldn't have heard him sing either. At the same time, an anonymous critic wrote of his, quote, honey sweet songs in melodious voice echoed by other contemporaries. Another author says he had a terrible voice, but that it was much improved by training. What's interesting is that after Nero's death, at least three fake Neros emerged, and each had to show that they could sing and play the lyre well. This suggests that, at least to his contemporaries, Nero was a talented artist. The idea he was awful at singing and playing the lyre could be pure legend, an attempt at discrediting his character with later biased accounts. Again, Nero's skill is less relevant than the mere fact he carried his life as an artist. He worked very hard to change Roman attitudes with regard to the arts, especially Hellenistic culture and entertainment. In 60 AD, he hosted public games that were almost entirely modelled off the classical Greek ones, namely in three parts divided between music, gymnastics, and equestrian sports. Note the year, 60 AD, one year after his mother's murder. Nero didn't participate himself in these games. Instead, he actively encouraged senators to compete. It was a way of telegraphing he was running things. Artistic and athletic skills were things to value under his watch. Surprisingly, many elites actually did participate. In those cases, there doesn't seem to be any evidence of coercion, though the elite's desire to please the emperor could be considered political point scoring. We can only derive from this a genuine attempt to soften Roman attitudes toward activities that were important to the Greeks. He built several gymnasiums in Rome, practically unheard of for the time. When Nero opened public baths in Rome in 61 AD, he marked the occasion by giving out free oil to senators and knights, clearly a nudge to get into athletics. But this would be one of Nero's greatest mistakes. The elite was not ready for such drastic shifts these things take time before they're socially acceptable. Nero was too rash, too impatient, and more disgraceful of all, he put his own desire to compete ahead of politics. Moreover to the elite, Nero's artistry went hand in hand with a depraved core. This was a man without morals, a man who defiled Vestal virgins, who sodomized his stepbrother and bedded his own mother. This man was simply a beast. Oh. Oh, omnivorous power You must be content with that, my throat. <laughs>